Uh, if you will take your Bible and turn to Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 137. We're in a series in Psalm 119 where we're taking this last section of these sections of Psalm 119, and today we're in verses 137 to 144. Now, while you're turning there, I want you to think about uh, things in your life that are really familiar and comfortable. Maybe, uh, maybe you've got your spot on the couch. In our family, when we watch a movie, everybody kind of has their spot, okay? Okay. Uh, Maybe it's a vacation spot that your family's gone to for years. You don't have to think about it. You know where you're going. You know the groceries you've got to buy. You know exactly what you're going to do. You know where you're going to go out to eat. You don't even have to think. You just get there, and it's familiar, and you know it. Uh, Maybe you've got an old pair of blue jeans or maybe an old pair of pajama pants that you only wear around your house, right? They're just, they're just, just comfortable, just this, 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 uh, this old uh, comfortable, familiar thing. Maybe you've got an old friend, somebody that you're just yourself with. You don't have to put on airs. You don't have to be on when you're around this person. These are tried and true people, places, or things. They bring, they bring a sense of settledness to us. They feel like home. They feel familiar. Well, what I want us to see is that... Um, This is how the writer of Psalm 119 describes God's promise in verse 140. He says in verse 140, your promise is well tried and your servant loves it. He describes God's promise as well tried, as familiar, trusted, a place of refuge and refreshment. That's how he describes God's word and my hope today is that we would leave here not only knowing and loving God's word, but that we would leave here saying God's promise is well tried. It's familiar. It's a place of rest and refreshment for me. When all the world is going crazy around me, God's word is well tried. That's what I want us to leave here saying in our our hearts and minds about God's word today. So I'm going to read uh, verses 137 to 144. I'm going to pray. And then we're going to jump into what God's word says. Let's read God's word together. Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. You have appointed your testimonies in righteousness and in all faithfulness. My zeal consumes me because my foes forget your words. Your promise is well tried and your servant loves it. I'm small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is righteous forever and your law is true. Trouble and anguish have found me out, but your commandments are my delight. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. Let's pray together. Lord, that is our prayer. Give us understanding that we may live. Help us understand your word. Help us understand your promises. Help us understand our own souls and our own hearts and lives and to see you know, where we run when trouble and anguish find us. Uh, Give us understanding, give us self-understanding so that we may get word understanding. Lord, drive us, drive us to your word today. Lord, we pray that you would uh, give us hearts that are ready to receive your word, eyes that can see beautiful and wonderful things, and ears that can hear wonderful things from your word today. Because many of us find ourselves in trouble and anguish. Some of us have come out of it, some of us are about to go in it, some of us are right in the middle of it of it. And so we need your well-tried promises today. So help us see them, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Here's the big idea for our time today, okay? It's this. When facing trouble, we run to God in his word. That's all I've got to say today. It's going to take me 25 minutes, okay? But when facing trouble, we run to God and his word. First thing is facing trouble. There's a reason that the promises of God are well-tried for the psalmist. The reason is that he is facing different kinds of trouble that keep driving him back to God and his word. He mentions a few in the section. Look at verse 139. He says, my zeal consumes me because my foes forget your words. Foes are enemies. Those are people who are opposed to you or against you. And the writer says, I have enemies who don't keep God's word. That's a form of trouble. Now, now many of us, perhaps we think we have enemies, 
And really, those are just people who disagree with us. Everyone who disagrees with me is not my enemy. Now, in our world today, it's very easy for us to quickly lump people who disagree with me in that bucket. But just because someone disagrees with me doesn't necessarily make them an enemy. The writer has real enemies. Real enemies. And this is bringing him trouble. Now, the second source of trouble is in verse 141. He says, I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. So in contrast to the powerful who are oppressing others and maybe even his enemies in verse 139, the writer says, I'm small and despised. Now, it's not a problem to be small, okay? That's not a problem, either in stature, like how your size, or your station, like what God's called you to. That's not a problem to be small. We're trained to think it is. We always think bigger is better, bigger house, bigger budget, bigger opportunity. We always think bigger is better, and that's not always the case. God can do more with small that belongs to him than big that does not. One of my favorite writers is Francis Schaeffer, and in his essay, No Little People, No Little Place, he says this. It's going to be on the screen. We must remember throughout our lives that in God's sight, there are no little people and no little places. Only one thing is important, to be consecrated persons in God's place for us at each moment. Those who think of themselves as little people in little places, if committed to Christ and under his lordship in the whole of life, may by God's grace change the flow of our generation. Being or feeling small is not a problem with God. There's no little people, and therefore there's no really big people in a spiritual sense. Now, the problem is not that this writer is feeling small. The problem is that he is small and despised. Now, despised could get at the idea of disregarded, discounted, demeaned. And when you are small and and despised, there's a, a sense of safety that's involved here. You feel unable to stop it. You can start feeling like you're in a prison, maybe at work. Maybe uh, your boss just never gives you any attaboys. Like you you work hard, you do your best, you're always passed over, you're always disregarded, you're never acknowledged for the work you do, and you feel small and despised. Maybe you're in a relationship where you feel small and despised. And if that's the case, you you feel like the person you're with just makes you feel like nothing and like you're not important and you're not valuable. And if that's the case and you're married, I would urge you to get some help because that's not healthy or good. And if you're not married, I would encourage you to get away because that's not healthy or good. If you are in a relationship where you feel small and despised, that's not how God longs for us to treat one another. And so the writer says, I'm small and despised. This is part of the trouble that the writer is facing. Now, finally, the writer is facing trouble because trouble and anguish have found him in verse 143. He says, trouble and anguish have found me out. Now, uh, one translation says, trouble and anguish have taken hold of me. Now, we don't know exactly what kind of trouble and anguish this is. Maybe it's the enemies uh, or his foes. Maybe it's uh, a health issue. Maybe it's just life in a fallen world. We don't know exactly what kind of trouble and anguish this writer is dealing with. What we do know is that trouble and anguish is our normal experience living in a fallen world. Here's what Jesus said. He said, I have said these things, this is John 16, 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation or trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Listen, we're going to have trouble and anguish in this world. Every single one of us is either in the midst of trouble and anguish, coming out of trouble and anguish, or about to go in to trouble and anguish. Every single one of us. That's what life is like in a fallen world. And therefore, we should be really gentle with one another because every one of us is facing a, a silent, unseen battle. And so when we engage one another, we need to remember this person is living in a fallen world. This person is facing things I don't know about. This person might be facing trouble. And so I need to be really, really gentle with them. Now, the question in the midst of trouble is not when will it end. Though 
my heart wants to ask that question. Like, when will this be over, God? How long, O Lord, as the psalmist says, psalmist says other places. The question is not when will it end. The most important question is where will I run? Most important question when we're facing trouble is not when will it end. The most important question is where will I run? And I want us to see here that the writer runs in the midst of trouble and anguish. He runs to God's word. He runs to God's word. Notice, every time he mentions trouble, he runs to God's word. Verse 141, he says, I'm small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Verse 143, trouble and anguish have found me out, but your commandments are my delight. Verse 140, your promise is well tried. So God's word is a well tried refuge in the writer's life. When he's facing trouble and anguish, he runs to God's word. And he says that he loves it in verse 140. He says it's true in verse 142. He says it's his delight in verse 143. Now, we should ask why he feels this way about God's word. Why would he love it and delight in it in the midst of trouble and anguish? Well, the writer tells us he loves God's word because of God's character. Look at verse 137. He says, righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. Notice that the writer starts this section with something about God. And he says, God is righteous. He says, righteous are you, O Lord. That gives us two things about our God. First, that he's righteous. Now, for God to be righteous means that he acts in accordance with what is right and is himself the standard of what is right. He acts in accordance with what is right, and he himself is the standard for what is right. What that means is I am not the standard, you are not the standard, we collectively are not the standard, Uh, cancel culture is not the standard, the cultural winds are not the standard, regardless of which direction they're blowing from. God himself is the standard for what is right. He is righteous. It also means that he acts in accordance with what is right. And verse 142 says that he's like this forever. Your righteousness is righteous forever, he says. And so that means when things are good and when things are bad, God is acting in accordance with what is right. When life is a confusing blur of pain and difficulty or when it's the best you could have ever imagined, God is acting in accordance with what is right. Now, it might take us a minute to see that. Writers for a long time have talked about this idea of a tapestry that God is weaving, and and we see the bottom of it. We see the the, the tattered threads and the knots and and all the, the, the ugly part of the back of the tapestry while God sees the beauty that he's weaving. And it might take us a long time to see the beauty that he's weaving in the midst of a difficult time. But what the writer says is that God is righteous. He's the standard of what's right, and he always acts in accordance with that standard. Now, the next thing we learn about God is that he is Lord. Verse 137, righteous are you, O Lord. Now, when Lord is all caps, that's referring to God's covenant name. It's God's name that he gave his people to tell them, I'm going to keep my promises. I'm going to do what I say. And God has kept his promises with all the opportunities throughout the Old and New Testament for God to stop keeping his promises. For all the opportunities in my life, throughout my history, and all of human history, there have been all kinds of opportunities for God to not keep his promises. But he's a God who keeps them. In fact, the word is rhymed with faithfulness in verse 138. You have appointed your testimonies in righteousness and faithfulness. That rhymes with 137, righteous are you, O Lord, That, O Lord, rhymes with faithfulness there. And think about, think about all the times God's had an opportunity to just be done with us. Think early, like way back in the book of Exodus. And one of my favorite spots is in Exodus 32. So God's people have been set free from Egypt. Uh, They've been taken through the Red Sea. They've been protected. They've been given water and food to eat in miraculous ways. And now they find themselves 
around Mount Sinai. Moses is on the mountain meeting with God. The people are down around the mountain, scared of what Moses is meeting with. <clears throat> they get kind of frustrated with God's timeline because it's taken Moses a long time to come back down. And this is what Exodus 32 says. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up! So Aaron's like Moses' second. He's the guy in charge right now. Up! Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. And so Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. So uh, if you remember the Ten Commandments, that's the second one. Okay, They've had it for like 12 chapters, broke the second one already. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So that's the first one and the third one. Okay, So they've broken the first three right here. And when Aaron saw this, so he sees the people being positive about what's happened. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar and, said, and Aaron made a proclamation. Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord, all caps, Yahweh. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, it says. Now, now Moses is up on the mountain meeting with the God they're offending. Circled in fire and thunder and lightning. And God says to Moses, go down for your people. Now, if I ever come home and Cheryl says, do you know what your children did? I know something is wrong, right? Go down for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way I've commanded them. They've made for themselves a golden calf, worshipped it, sacrificed to it, saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who you brought up out of the land of Egypt. So Moses goes down the mountain sees that they've lost their collective mind and says to them, you've sinned a great sin. Like you, This is a big deal. I'm going to go back up on the mountain and meet with God to see if he'll show you mercy. And God does. Like he had a really great opportunity to annul this thing and say, no, we're not doing this. I'll start over. But he's a God who keeps his promises because that's the kind of God that he is. And so the writer delights in this God because he's righteous. He's the standard of what's right and he always acts in accordance with what's right. And he's faithful to his promises. He's faithful to his promises. And so the writer says that he loves God's word in 140, that he delights in it in 143, that he wants more of it in 144. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. I want, I want to know your testimonies more. Give me understanding that I may live. And so when the writer is facing trouble, he runs to God and his word. He runs to this God who is righteous and this God who is faithful. And he believes in his word because he trusts in his God. Which leads to a really important question for all of us. Is God's promise well tried in your life? When you're facing trouble, where do you run? Do you run to God's promise? Is God's promise that familiar, restful, refreshing place that it is for the psalmist here? Is that where you run? Because we're going to run somewhere when we're facing trouble and anguish. <clears throat> Some of us, when we hit trouble and anguish, we run to ourselves. We think that the answer for this moment is for me to be strong, for me to be in control, for me to be powerful. And if I can just be strong and control and powerful, I'll get through this. For some of us, we, we don't think that's our answer. We think our answer in, in trouble and anguish is to escape as fast as possible. And so we escape into food or drink or entertainment or something new and shiny. If I can just get those things, I can escape this trouble and anguish. Some of us, we think that the escape from our trouble and anguish is the next opportunity we have, the next goal we can achieve. Where do you run? Where do you run in the midst of trouble? Because the, the, the question in the midst of trouble is not when will it end. The question is where do we run? Where do we run? Where do we run? 
the psalmist runs to God's promise. He says, your promise is well tried. All those other places we could run are tired. God's promise is well tried. It's well tried. Now listen, sometimes we think <clears throat> that God's promises equal our wishes. God has never promised to keep your wishes. He has promised to keep his promises. And so what we need is to know his promises. We need to know his promises that are well tried in our lives. And so this week I was just thinking back on to, you know, what are some promises that have been really important to me? What are some promises, what are some places in God's word that I just kind of keep going back to over and over and over again? And the first one I remember, like the very first promise I remember being important to me was Psalm 139. Um, I, I deeply struggled with how God made me for a long list of reasons. And I remember my mom growing up just wearing me out with Psalm 139. Psalm 139 says this, I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. That was a promise. That was a promise that, that I went back to and continue to go back to over and over and over. It's well tried in my life. Another one early on was Hebrews 13.5 that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Just a really important promise in my life, particularly early. It's a blessing to know that God will never leave me. And then another promise I return to is a promise about what Jesus did on the cross. Because listen, though, though I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and though God will never leave me, I so often leave him. And I, and I run to all these other things that I mentioned. And the Bible calls that running idolatry, and it calls it a great evil. It's the same thing as building a golden calf. It just doesn't look like that. It's a great sin, the Bible says. It's called idolatry. And because I've run from this God who made me and never leaves me, I've got this sin problem. And so this promise that is really important to me is from Colossians 2.13. It says, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Now, Paul's taking something from Roman, you've heard me tell this story. God's uh, Paul is taking something from Roman culture where if you committed a crime, you'd go before a judge, they would give you a certificate. It would have your crime and your punishment. And while you were carrying out that punishment, whether that was stocks or chains or work, you would have this certificate of debt posted next to you. And when you finished, when you fulfilled your responsibility, you would take that back to the judge and the judge would stamp one Greek word across it, the word tetelestai. The word means paid in full or it is finished. And when Jesus hung from the cross in our place, he, one of the last words he said was to tell us die. It's a promise that he has forgiven all our trespasses when we trust in him. He's canceled my debt. That's an important promise for me. And then as I grew, I started to connect my acceptance with God to my achievement for God. And maybe I'm the only one in the world that's ever done that, but it was a really uh, important connection for me to break. This connection between my, my achievement for God and my acceptance with God, it was really important that I not connect those two because the Bible doesn't connect those two. And I remember, I remember where I was, what I was wearing, what it felt like, what the temperature was like. I mean, I remember this moment, and it was 30 years ago when I read this verse. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. That's a well-tried promise from God's word. And then as I stepped into things that were really scary and intimidating, I remember reading in Jeremiah 32 one day, Behold, I'm the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? And the answer, of course, is no. Is anything too hard for me, God says? The answer is no. And then as we stepped into seeing God plant this church, 
I remember reading in Matthew 16 where Jesus says, I will build my church. Now, he doesn't promise he'll build this one. He promises he'll build his. And to the degree that we are part of his story, he promises that he's going to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that's a promise. It's a promise. And then as we saw God working and, and creating this church, I remember reading Philippians 1.6. It says, I'm sure of this, that he, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now, we read that and think it means me. The word you there is plural. He's talking to the church. It should be translated y'all, right? He who began a good work in y'all will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus. That's a promise to that church and this one. Then on days that are really hard, when it's more than just the normal trouble and anguish of living in a broken world, it's those days when trouble and anguish have put me in the middle of the ring and body slam me and are dropping the people's elbow on me over and over. And I'm laying in there just bloodied and bruised and just wondering what's going on. There are two promises that I hang on to. First one is Romans 8, 28. For we know, not we wish, not we hope, not we wonder, we know, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. That's a promise. It's well tried. The other promise that gets me through those kind of days is the, memory, is the reality that it will not always be this way. Not just that God's working all things, like all things. He's working them together for my good. <clears throat> I remember also that it won't, <clears throat> excuse me, I remember also that it won't always be this way. It won't. I remember the promise from Revelation 21. John says, then I saw a new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. When I'm, when I'm facing a really difficult moment, I try to remember it's not always going to be this way. Like, this is coming. It, it's, all working for, it's all working together for my good. I believe that with everything I have, but it also won't always be this way. There's coming a day when I'll wipe away every tear. And then as if just to put an exclamation point on it, he says, and he who was seated on, the, seated on the throne said, behold, I'm making all things new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are faithful and true. These are well-tried promises. Well-tried promises. That when I'm in the midst of trouble and anguish, whether that's from outside of me or inside of me, like I can run to these promises and find hope when I'm facing trouble. And so the question is this, what, what, are, what are the promises of God that you're running to? What are the promises of God that you're running to? Again, he has not promised to keep your wishes. He has promised to keep his promises. And so we need to know them. We need to know them so that we can run to them. Because we're going to face trouble and anguish. We're going to face trouble and anguish. And when we do, we need to know his promises. Let's pray together. Father, we, we run to you this morning, trusting your word. We know that you are a righteous God. You are a faithful God. You are a God who keeps his promises to his people. And Lord, we, we know that primarily because you sent your son to live, die, and rise again so that we could trust you, so that we could have life, so that we could be forgiven, but so that we could know that you keep your promises. And because Jesus is alive, 
we know your word to be true. Because Jesus died on the cross, we know our sin to be forgiven. And because Jesus rose again and ascended to the Father, we know that he will one day return and make all things new. And we will be with you. You will be our God. We will be your people forever. And so, Lord, I pray um, for my brothers and sisters who are facing trouble and anguish, particularly those who are facing significant, difficult, challenging trouble and anguish. Lord, I pray that your promises would be well tried in their lives, that they would love your word, that they would delight in your word, that they would find in your word the very words of life. Lord, make it so. Make it so, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.